Men's Garden Club of Asheville at War Meeting Aug. 17, 2022 Governor's Western Residence Speaker is Rachel Merweather, Department Head of the Horticultural Education Program at Blue Ridge Community College. She presents an overview of her program, which is a recipient of our annual scholarship program. been at Blue Ridge for several years now and uh, we're excited for our club to have a small part in supporting that program. Uh, we, both of our horticulture scholarships are now designated for horticulture students at, at Blue Ridge Community College and happy happy to have that affiliation. All right, Rachel. <laughs> So just as a, a pre-warning, we of course have had some AVI issues, and so my PowerPoint and all that's not going to run, so this is going to be a little more like a family trip slideshow, right? They're not in order, so we're just going to kind of talk about the program as the photos come up. Um, so I know Randy already gave you a little bit of my background, but a little more for me personally. Um, plants has always been the thing I wanted to do. Even when I was little, and one of the photos, the only one that won't work is one of my favorite photos of all time is of me and my grandfather. My grandfather was a wonderful plantsman himself. And so even when I was little bitty, it's like a picture of me helping him plant a shrub, and it's just always been what I wanted to do. Um, that being said, I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do within the plant world. So I have hopped around throughout any part of it that I could get my hands on to, whether it was farming or nursery production or working for the park service. Um, along, for a long time, I thought I wanted to work in botanic gardens and that was just a different, difficult world to break into. And I ended up here working at a children's summer camp, managing the farm for a children's summer camp. So I have been very involved in youth education for a long time now and am thrilled over the last year to have been now the department head at Blue Ridge Community College. And I can't thank you all enough for supporting our students that are there. They all work very hard and are doing some incredible things within our community. Um, Y'all are, of course, welcome to ask me any questions. And I think just because this is turning out to be so informal, you should feel free to ask me questions while I'm talking, as opposed to us necessarily waiting for Q&A towards the end. All right, so, set this down for just, do I have to use this? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Awesome. I am so good at projecting. Um, obviously an instructor and a youth educator is a huge part of my career. Um, so we're just going to jump right in. Um, wow. Can these lights turn off? It doesn't matter. Um, so this is um, a quick picture of the interior of our greenhouse. We have some really great resources on campus, which is one of the things that sets us apart from a couple of other horticulture programs that are even anywhere near us in Western North Carolina, which there aren't many. They're kind of dropping like flies these days, which is a shame, but such is life. Um, this end of our greenhouse is more of the sort of like atypical propagation and some of the more unusual things we have in the greenhouse. This over here, we actually have a conservatory area within ground plantings in the greenhouse. So we have um, all sorts of Schefflera plants. We have a banana tree. Um, this is a uh, loquat tree that actually fruits in the greenhouse when we do hand pollinations and things like that with the students. Um, we are uh, doing all sorts of like native plant propagation. So these are the tables that every single one of these tables has individually uh, operated irrigation timers and things like that. So we can have very specific timings on the things we want to propagate, right? So this table can have 10 seconds of irrigation every 20 minutes, and then the one right next to it can be having two seconds of irrigation once every two hours. 
So we could have succulents going on this table, um, oak tree seedlings going on this table, this one right over here that you can't quite see. I think maybe in another one we have it. We have all sorts of orchids going right here. Um, and I'll go ahead and throw in, for any of y'all may have heard that we just got a really big grant to build a new greenhouse via the Golden Leaf Foundation. Um, their original intent was to get people away from tobacco farming, but keep them in agricultural or some kind. So ideally, what I hope is that this greenhouse is going, our old greenhouse, it's like the used Honda Civic of greenhouses, this is going to become our play with it, do whatever we want greenhouse. So we can have all sorts of propagation things going on and whatever we want to do. And then the big greenhouse, <laughs> ideally what I would like to see it become is a uh, standard production style greenhouse. So we would get to use it to teach students how some of those big production greenhouses that are part of Henderson County run, right? Because we have Ben Wingerden, we have Tri Histel that does all of the grafted vegetables and things like that. Uh, Bright Farms, which is originally a Canadian company, just moved into Henderson County, and I want to say they're going to build a greenhouse that has something like 100 acres under glass or something like that. Um, the greenhouse companies come to Henderson County for the same reason the breweries come, the incredible weather and the clean water. You don't have to do any of the things that you would have to do in other places where you have to filter water and clean it and all those things. They can just pump water straight into those greenhouses and then clean it a little bit, preferably, before they let it go straight back out into the water systems and things like that. So that's part of why we have some of those huge water, or huge greenhouse companies moving in. So ideally, our big new greenhouses is going to be prepping our students to walk straight into some of those high-tech greenhouses, right? Because I have any, has anybody gone into one of those high-tech greenhouses anytime recently? It is unbelievable how many robots they have. Uh, I mean, so many robots run stuff now. So you do need people to understand horticulture, but you have to have somebody that also knows how to fix a robot because the robots can go in and pick up every single little baby seedling, spread it apart, and put it into a bigger pot. Pick up the pots, move them over to a table, shift the table. It's just crazy what goes on in those greenhouses. You, you can't just know what the plants are about anymore. So, quick picture of our greenhouse. You need a bunch of old men. <laughs> I didn't know old men and robots were a thing. Uh, let's see, in some of these photos, okay, so um, here's one of some production we had going on. Uh, all of these tomatoes were actually donated to us by tri -Hishtel. I'm not sure you can see from this photo, but these are all grafted tomatoes. They have a little graft line right here. Um, as I'm sure many of you are aware, we have some pretty virulent tomato diseases here in western North Carolina that it is nigh on impossible to combat, right? I mean, at least on our farm, when we don't have ones that have been specifically bred against this, we try and get them started as early as possible in the spring, we get them in the ground as fast as possible, we get all the tomatoes we want, and then here comes the late blight, and we say bye to the tomatoes. Because there's just nothing you can do, right? And certainly, if you're growing organically, forget about it. I mean, even some of the systemics can't fight late blight. So, uh, uh, somewhere in this, is going to be our hydroponic tables and so what we did is we took all of these grafted tomatoes and we grew them hydroponically through the winter and got tomatoes in february it was fantastic and i feel like my family was very jealous most of the time uh poinsettias are kind of stuck in here again you'll get some better uh pictures in a little while these were kind of ones that didn't fit on that table so they got crammed in there with the tomatoes um, we do three big production cycles right now within the production side of this greenhouse. The mums are in right now, though they're not flowering just yet. Poinsettia plugs should be here in a couple of weeks. We'll start those pretty soon, and then we do a big spring plant sale. It sounds similar to y'all. We get uh, plugs, and we also start seeds. Uh, we're just starting to try and get our grafting off the ground, so we do a little bit of grafting. Um, but yeah, some stuff going on in our greenhouse. Oh yeah. Lots of poinsettias. Um, the biggest challenge we have with poinsettias is um, the mealy bugs. In a greenhouse setting, the mealy bugs are just as happy as a mealy bug could ever be. The climate is always perfect, and the plants are always well fertilized and juicy, right? It just is never not mealy bug season in a greenhouse. Um, one of the big things, let's see if there's a better picture where you can see it. Yeah, so this greenhouse has a gravel floor. And that makes it even harder to control mealybugs, right? Because mealybugs produce massive amounts of eggs all the time. And so every time they have a reproduction cycle, they're dropping eggs in every single bit of that gravel. And sanitizing that gravel floor is 
a nightmare. Uh, ideally, our new granite house will have a concrete floor. And then we can power wash it, we can do all sorts of stuff to that concrete floor that we just can't do with this gravel, right? And so even though we're spraying for all the mealybugs up here, they're just like sitting in the ground waiting for the mealybugs on the plants to go away so they can repopulate the whole area. Um, this end here, so this is the production end of our greenhouse right now. There's a, a, a classroom sort of in the middle, and then when you're looking all the way through, that's the other end we just saw a picture of, right, where the conservatory and our specialty propagation are. It's on the other end of our greenhouse. So our greenhouse, and again, y'all are getting even the photos I didn't include in the PowerPoint. So y'all are getting a lot of photos. <laughs> Uh, we also did a lot of strawberry pop propagation this past season. Um, strawberry farms are relatively popular in Henderson County, um, just because uh, you pick farms have gotten more popular recently. And so I think we have three or four farms now that manage to pull off strawberry production, which is actually relatively challenging um, because of our humid climate, right? So strawberries are very prone to any of the mildew problems. Um, it's really hard to do them if you don't actually have some sort of plastic ground cover, right? Because if they're sitting on the dirt, they're just that much more likely and you have to pick them really, really quickly on a regular basis. Um, so these were all runners that we did in the greenhouse. And again, got these strawberries in January, which is pretty fun. Uh, these are some carrots from our outdoor veggie garden. Um, when I took over as department head uh, a year ago, we have way too much turf as far as I'm concerned, around our greenhouse. We have almost no green, uh, like veggie production beds. Uh, we have very little exterior plantings of any kind, so that's been a big thing we've been trying to do is shift turf over to vegetable production. Um, because at least Henderson County, I'm not really as familiar with Bun Buncombe County's breakdown, but in Henderson County, agriculture is still the number one source of income. Um, those greenhouses sway that data just a little bit because they're so large and they bring in so much income and they employ so many people, but the farms are still really important too. We have some huge apple farms and we have a couple of really large veggie producers as well. So I feel it's really important in plant world in particular that you get to see things in real life, particularly for our students. There's only so much you can learn about horticulture from a lecture, right? You need to see it in real life and it still shocks me after years of working with children, that somebody in college doesn't know that a carrot is under the dirt. Right? Like, <laughs> somebody picked out the carrot right here on the ground. Oh, not this one. Oh, he's got a pull in this, and there's a carrot under the ground. It does not grow in a tree, it's not above ground. So, even I, exactly um, that I have a 22 year old student that this is still like finding treasure, right? And that experience alone, if you just it's worth converting some surf over to veggie gardens, and you get to eat fresh carrots, which is always really fun. Our president made a nice comment. They really come in plastic bags. They do. <laughs> they come in plastic bags, exactly. Yeah, you just hang it there with like sea monkeys, right? And they just sort of grow there. Oh yes. Um, very, very interesting to hear people's perspective. Or like children in particular, we walk them out on the farm and like ask them what we think this vegetable was. Green beans, almost every time. Didn't matter what it was, I always guess green beans. I don't know why. Um, these are some of our poinsettias all dressed up, right, ready to go out into the world. Um, certainly with our students that we want to teach about full production methods, growing them is one thing, marketing them is a whole other ball game, right? Like how do you actually get the public to want to purchase this thing? And for somebody who, again, is not, um, super familiar with what plants look like or, or what it's going to look like in a greenhouse. If you just hand them this in this dirty black pot, that is not the same to them mentally as this, right? It's been all shined up and it's got its costume on and it's ready to see the world. Um, so even that part of it is a layer that we need to discuss with our students that you can't, you, it doesn't stop right here if you're a retail business. There's a difference between wholesale and retail and we really try and cover both of those aspects of production methods. Oh, great, hydroponic tomatoes. Um, so we'll see some other ones. So hydroponic table is right down here, right? Um, again, in a couple of photos, you'll get to see it. There's a huge tank sort of right under the table. And these are standard ebb and flow tables. So a pump is gonna come on, water is gonna pump out of here. It'll sit in here for about 10 minutes and then it all flows back into the chamber. Um, we grow all of ours. You can, there's a couple of different mediums you can use for hydroponics. We do the expanded volcanic rock, 
partially because you can sanitize and use it again. And being a community college, we're of course on a budget. So rock wool that you can throw, you have to throw away. You can't use it time after time. So all of these tomatoes are planted into this. Um, and we have a very technical uh, support system, obviously, with some string that we tied to some PVC pipe and ceiling. Um, nothing like some creative problem solving. Uh, a really unexpected side benefit I found from this particular one is tomatoes are an incredible plant to use to teach hand pollination. I don't know, they are, right? Um, if you ever, I mean, I, I guess again, I'm talking to a crowd that might have done this, but if you ever actually looked really closely at a tomato flower, it looks like a textbook flower, right? You can see everything, all of it, stigma, style, ovary, all of it is just right there, like laid out right in front of you. So in turn, and we of course don't have insects in the greenhouse. So if you don't have insects in the greenhouse and you want tomatoes, somebody's gotta do that by hand. Um, so we, uh, my greenhouse techs had a great time, crawling through and hair and hand pollinating tomatoes throughout the winter. Uh, we even gave a few of them to the biology department when they were doing dissections and things like that. Uh, but they got huge, right? These things made it to the ceiling line. Um, in their native habitat, tomatoes are perennial, and if you give them the chance, they will get massive, right? They will drape over things, and you can make awnings out of them, and they did. They had a great time. Um, we ended up pulling them out just because they got too leggy and we were ready to switch them out. I'm pretty sure I have some photos in here. Uh, we switched over to greens. And so we did mustard greens, lettuces, dandelion greens, and a couple other things in this hydroponic table once we pulled the tomatoes. Uh, some plug trays. Sounds like y'all are relatively familiar with plug trays. Uh, so some of the things we start from seed ourselves, but again, in terms of educational purposes, I really need the students to see all aspects of horticulture. So park seed is primarily who we get our plugs from. All these 220 trays, right, they come in these teeny tiny little things and we're stepping them up, mostly straight into a gallon size. Some of them we do a four inch, but another thing we talk about a lot in terms of being a business person is your time is the most valuable thing. When you are a small business owner and you work in this setting, the more often you handle a plant, the more your profit drops, right? So if you want it to end up in a one gallon, if you have to take the time to put this in a four inch and then you have to replant the four inch pot into a one gallon pot, you just handled that plant twice instead of one time. All of that counts when you're talking about the economics of whether or not that plant is making you any money. Um, so we usually go straight into one gallons. Uh, these are some impatiens. Impatiens are actually pretty tricky to get to start from seed, um, especially this variety. So these were much easier to describe as plugs and let somebody else start those for us. Oh yeah, another good family photo that's sideways. Um, this is, uh, we do a lot of uh, herbs in particular. A lot of our students are really interested in herb production. And herbs tend to have some pretty weird germination needs, right? Like, uh, they're going to need to be stratified, they're going to need to go into a fridge for a month, things like that. Uh, so this is just a table with some of our really fun little teeny tiny herbs that <laughs> I feel like I can read a couple of those. Um, but just another fun propagation table in our greenhouse. Oh, there's one of our tomatoes. Um, yeah, my husband loves tomato sandwich. He's actually playing music at the Etowah Farmer's Market, and they're paying him in free tomato sandwiches today. <laughs> <laughs> so he was, pretty, he was pretty excited about this experiment we had going out in the greenhouse because we got tomatoes all winter. Oh my gosh, I, have been, I love teeny tiny babies. Um, these are all little baby seedlings, uh, basil seedlings. And I just, I don't know, I know that they're plants, but they're still just the cutest things, like little baby plants, I just love them so much. Um, I actually had a greenhouse job for a little while where uh, plants actually develop differently when they're exposed to wind and things like right, that, so physiologically their stems and things are different if they're sitting in a greenhouse environment that never moves. So my job was to walk along tables and like run my hands across them because it makes them stronger when they have, it was the greatest job. <laughs> Just go pet the plant. Uh, so here's the students helping convert some of that turf, right? Uh, so the greenhouse is sort of behind me right here. Um, you'll see some other photos of the high tunnel and things we have going on, but this is all, we just have so much lawn. There's so much lawn and it just could be put so much a better purpose. Um, so we started a little herb garden right here, and then you'll see a few more of the row crops. Um, a couple of students brought their dogs. This is also a really fun day. Uh, the tiller broke twice, so we also got to have some equipment operations and maintenance 
lessons on this day. Um, we got to repair our belt on the little tiller we had going on right over here. Um, yeah, this was a good learning experience for them. And I don't know how many of y'all have ever converted turf to actual growing, but it is not fun no. and it is not easy. And I mean, given a year, if we could have put a tarp over that and killed the grass first, great. But that was not what I wanted it. I needed to go right now because we got students, semesters roll over, we got to make this started. So we got to get out there and hand pull a lot of weeds, till it a few times, rake it, till it again, rake it, till it again, try and put some compost tea out there and bring all the creatures back. And uh, very, very labor intensive learning experience for this one in particular. Uh, and there's a little babies went in. Um, so same, this is that same veggie garden that we managed to get. So this is last fall's garden. So these are mostly cabbages, kale. Um, I know we had some arugula. Uh, chard was definitely in there. Um, this has all now been converted to the summer garden. So there's totally different plants out there at this point. Another plant that we actually have inside the greenhouse that we also work hand pollination with. So passion flower, uh, along with being a crazy beautiful plant, is really easy to hand pollinate, right? Because you can just pull off one of these little guys and rub it on there and voila, you've just hand pollinated uh, a patchy body of the mushroom. The way this organism works is it sends its spores out and it'll land on ant bodies and then it sends the mycelium growing all the way through the ant's body. Once the mycelium is fully populated the ant, it ta taps into what its nervous system is and then it'll have the ant go to almost always about three meters high across the forest, you can always find them at that height, and then it'll have the ant lock down onto a leaf, and then it'll melt its mandibles so that its mandibles can't come loose. Oh, it's still gruesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it consumes the ant from the inside, and then it sends out its fruiting body to make more. Um, ants have so many defense mechanisms against this, because it is obviously terrifying, and it would be horrible, so like, uh, the guard ants that are at the front of the uh, colony, if an ant comes to the front door and they detect that it has these spores on it, it'll grab that ant and they'll go and kill it and bury it and then kill themselves and bury themselves with the dead ant because it is just horrible if an ant gets into the main colony and this spreads in there. <laughs> Amazing. Mushrooms are incredible. They really are. I mean, they are, they do absolutely incredible things. And there are many types of zombie mushrooms out there. Uh, we get zombie flies on our farm all the time. I don't have them in this. I have a couple of on my phone. But sure enough, every now and then around the farm, when we walk around, there'll be a fly that won't fly away. And if you watch it for a couple of days, sure enough, its body will swell up. And then, poof, this mushroom comes out of it and sends spores out all over the place. <laughs> Just crazy. Um, <laughs> children almost always ask, well, how do we know that they don't do this to us? I'm like, well, how do you know they aren't? <laughs> organisms, one of the first terrestrial organisms on our planet. They have been here a long time. I think as our technology as humans gets more sophisticated, we are more and more aware of how much fungi are controlling our world. That they speak to the trees, that they speak to the other organisms, that they're doing all sorts of things all the time that are affecting our universe that we just weren't even aware of previously. Um, so yeah, zombie ants. We go on a field trip where, um, if you've ever heard of Mushroom Mountain, it's just over the border in South Carolina, and he is just doing some of the craziest stuff with mushrooms. Um, and this, he has them all over the place, right? So you can walk around and he's got ones marked so you can be sure to see a zombie ant while you're there. It's well worth the field trip. <laughs> uh, let's see, this is our greenhouse in full spring plant sale mode. Uh, these are all students right now. I think this is probably a couple of days before because I don't see any of the signs out yet. Um, but this is probably our biggest money maker right now. Um, we're just now, they, had, they hadn't done moms or poinsettias before I got there. So that's kind of still, uh, we're trying to get into that a little more. We ended up donating most of our poinsettias last year because we just didn't have a marketing outlet for them particularly. But the plant sale is still a pretty big deal. And uh, we had a lot of success this year. The students were just, I don't know, I'm so proud of them. They did such an incredible job. Uh, so this is as full as the greenhouse ever gets. Right, it was just slap full. We were having to put stuff under tables, and um, yeah, I think in a minute we'll have some where we did sell a few aloes and bromeliads. I know they want to start doing, they being the students, were interested in doing a little bit more of this specialty propagation, having these for sale, because 
I mean, I don't know what y'all sell at your plant sale, but at least for us, the most expensive thing that we really sell is like $4. Right, we didn't really have anything over that. So if we started having some of these specialty things and could sell something that's $20, even more money. <laughs> uh, we did a lot of succulent propagation. We found this really cool company that uh, gave all of the, I mean, they, they weren't much. They sent us individual leaves. But of course, with a succulent, you can grow it from anything. Um, and they gave them to us for free. So one day when it was like Christmas, we got these two huge boxes and it was just like so many varieties of succulents. Uh, so we had a lot of succulents at our plant sale this year that are still in the greenhouse and a lot of fun to look at. Another fun sideways one. Um, again, some students getting ready. We're getting closer now. You can see they started to put signage out and put prices. Um, they all did, uh, so they're all, our students are of course a community college group, so they come from all over, and they each had a couple of different places they were supposed to stop and see what the prices were for things, so it was up to them to set prices for all of our plant sale. I do my best to not dictate to them, right? I really want them to think about things. I am absolutely a true believer in education, and I think a huge part of education is teaching you to think. How do you problem solve? You don't need somebody to just give you this answer. How do you find that answer on your own? If you are going to own a nursery and you need to price your things, you need to figure out how to price that yourself. You are going to have somebody telling you what that price is. So it was up to them to do their market research, come up with pricing. I think they did a great job. Just some more eye candy of the greenhouse. I love it when it's full like this. It's just so amazing. <laughs> um, the nest nursery ran right out the door. Question, great question. Great yeah. Would you? It's very interesting, and I, it's got we're enjoying it. But I, I want to make sure: Are you going to give us a little bit of a better idea of how the scholarship program works? So the scholarship program itself, I am not hugely involved in. Right? I don't award scholarships. There is I a. I know you don't. Mm -hmm, um, but, but you teach it. Lisa, Lisa is more involved in that. Yes, so Lisa Adkins is the person who runs our uh, foundation office, and we also have a financial aid office, and that is all. I can recommend the scholarship to certain students, but I don't get to award it myself. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I feel like that would be a massive conflict of interest. It would be really hard for me to not have favorites. I have to admit, I might as well just like, up front, oh my gosh, I want you to get the scholarship. Um, I am more than happy, though, to share a little bit of the structure of our program. Uh, that was something that I was absolutely going to get to. So um, we have a few different degree programs. Um, our biggest degree is an associate's degree. It's 68 hours in order to complete the associate's degree. You're supposed to, if you're doing full-time, be able to complete it in two years. As of right now, we don't have any of the things that are articulation agreements, right? Which is what we have to have in order for students to go on to a four-year university if they want to. That is one of my huge goals over the next couple of years, is to set up articulation agreements. So that if somebody wants to come to us for two years, possibly on your scholarship, and get all those intro classes out of the way, then we have made it as smooth as possible of a transition into a four-year university if that's what they want to go to. So our biggest one is an associate degree. Next under that is a diploma. That one you should be able to complete within uh, two semesters, maybe three. So that one's 37 credit hours to complete that one. Under that is our certificates. We have six of those. Those tend to be fairly popular because a lot of times what we get, particularly in horticulture and in a community college, is people who already have a job, or they already know what they want to do, and all they need to do is expand their knowledge in a particular area. Right, so they may just want more information on greenhouse automation. Or maybe they just want to learn a little bit more about nursery operations. We have a business of horticulture certificate. So in that, uh, most of them are anywhere from 12 to 17 hours to complete a certificate. So you should be able to do that in one, maybe two semesters, depending on your personal schedule. At that point, again, you it's not that you need a degree. What you need is to expand your knowledge. And that's what community college does mission is all about in a large way is expanding the knowledge base within our community right here as opposed to a university maybe that is you're meant to go wherever after that we do really want a lot of those students to stay right here in our communities so we have those three tiers as much as possible um, again the thing that I feel like we are missing is the ability for students who are from here that don't want to spend all that money on a four-year degree for those first two years to be able to use us as a stepping stone to that next, next step, I guess. Yeah? Uh, 
Any questions about that? Thank you. Excellent. Yes. How many students are finished are graduating with your associate's degree? Let's see. Uh, this summer we had four graduate and two of them were associate degrees. One of them was a certificate and one was a diploma. Okay. So you have spring and then you have fall term people? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, last spring we had seven graduates and all of them were associate degrees. So the associate degrees are more likely to graduate in the spring and fall, right. just because that's when most of our core classes are offered. Sure. We try not to offer core classes in the summer. We try and keep that exclusive to electives because a lot of our students are returning students and they might have kids and jobs and things like that. And summer is the best time to have a job in the horticulture industry. Um, it's also when their kids aren't in school anymore. So it kind of messes up the flow of their degree if they have to skip a class we offer in summer, right? So suddenly, you didn't take this class, we aren't offering it for three more semesters, and suddenly you can't graduate for three semesters because you need this one class that we offered in summer when you couldn't take it. So most of the electives in the summertime, core classes in spring and fall, so that's when they graduate primarily. Um, we offer anywhere from seven to nine classes per semester, depending on how many adjuncts we have and how many sign-ups. So we need at least five students in a class to run a class. If we have less than that, if we have somebody that needs it to graduate, we might still run that class, but the economics get a little bit harder, so we need at least five people per class. Um, and a space, time, all of that really is gonna dictate how many classes we run. Uh, this semester I get to teach permaculture. Pretty stoked about that. That's always a really fun <coughs> class to teach. Um, greenhouse, nursery production, biological pest management, plant propagation, uh, our plant materials classes or all those classes where they're learning Latin names. It's just an endless stream of Latin names in plant materials. We're mostly grooming them to pass the certified plant professionals test, which is one of the things I want to say you have to have if you want to pass your uh, landscape designer certificate or if you want um, What's the other one you have to have that for? Uh, maybe it's if you want a nurseryman's association membership. I think that's one of the things you have to have. Um, if you, uh, a lot of our pest and ID and pest control classes are also they can get pesticide certifications. Because if you get, you already work for a landscaping company or maybe you work for the Biltmore or something like that, you have to be certified to spray some of those bigger pesticides, right? So we're usually setting them up to pass that test as much as possible. Hiring faculty, is that a challenge? Um, I should knock on some wood, so far no. Um, I know it can be for some of the other departments in the community college, but I have been very lucky thus far in the adjuncts that I have. Your staff is exclusively adjunct, you're full time? I'm only full time currently. Yeah. Um, we should be bringing on another full time person as soon as the new greenhouse is here, because there's just no way. I can manage two greenhouses, schools, gardens, everything. So it's written into that grant to have one other full-time person come on. And the adjuncts are incredible. Most of them, again, have jobs in the field. So they're already uh, landscape designers or um, they work or plant propagation. They have a small nursery at their own home. Uh, the man who does our equipment and operations in our landscape construction class, um, he does all sorts of big hardscaping jobs. Right, so this sort of thing is what he builds. So he does a really good job of teaching our students how to do some of this bigger construction. Um, all of the logistics that go into that, we have to cover zoning issues, um, drainage issues in our area is a huge thing. What kind of soil are you putting it on? You're gonna have the concrete crack if you don't pour it correctly. All of that comes into it, even though horticulture is mostly plants, this all counts too. Uh, water features, people around here love water features, and if you put in a bad water feature, you've just set a homeowner up for massive disappointment and frustration for the remaining years, because it's just gonna break, right? Something's gonna drain out, it's not gonna function like it should. Putting in water features is very challenging. So we cover that in our landscape construction classes. When is the new uh, greenhouse going to be complete? That is a great question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I personally turned in my wish list about three months ago, and it has now disappeared into the land of bureaucracy. Um, I know that it will be sent out, they're inviting bids at some point, I, that is outside my purview. Um, once that
that bid is granted because of the remaining supply chain issues due to the pandemic, I would say we'd be lucky if we saw it in 18 months. If it were three years, I wouldn't be surprised. Such is life. How big is that greenhouse going to be? Um, hopefully anywhere from four to 5,000 square feet. Um, and the biggest challenge with our old greenhouse, or one of the biggest challenges is, as far as I can tell, I wasn't around when it was put in, but if I had to guess, this is a kit greenhouse, so it's gonna come from somebody like Stuffy or one of those, that it's already, the pieces are already there, they're just waiting to bring it and put it together like Legos, right? It's not designed to our needs whatsoever. This one, keeping this greenhouse cool in the summer is really, really challenging because it doesn't have roof vents. Yeah. How do you keep a greenhouse cool in the southeast without roof vents? I, I, we don't. Uh, the alarms go off almost every day, right? Because the greenhouse, even with the big exhaust fans off to the side, and we have squat coolers over on this wall over here, even with that, it gets up to 110 in that greenhouse on a hot day. Uh, and there's just, again, without roof vents, there's almost nothing you can do to keep it cool. Even when you run the irrigation, you can't run it all the time because plants don't want to be wet all the time. It's very, very challenging. Uh, we might end up with some lights in our new greenhouse. Uh, the GE facility factory that's in Hendersonville has just recently started producing LED greenhouse lights, and they may donate lights to us if we let them bring customers to show off our greenhouse. Mm -hmm. So fingers crossed, we might actually end up with some grow lights in there, which would be kind of fun. Yeah. Nice LED ones too, not the big giant high pressure sodium lights that used to be the norm for greenhouses. And now they're just so compact and easy to put in. Um, so we'll see. Maybe some lighting. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank yeah. you. Right, I got two questions. Of course. One is my experience with greenhouse tomatoes has not been thrilling. Like, <laughs> is, is that because they just get picked when they green and ship, or can you actually get flavorful tomatoes in the greenhouse? So. It's both. One, all those greenhouse tomatoes are absolutely picked green, right? And then they're put into big chambers and dosed with ethylene gas, which is ethylene gas is produced by all produce, right? It's the reason you don't put other vegetables near bananas, because bananas are one of the biggest producers of ethylene gas and makes everything ripen. None of that produce would ever ripen, right? Those tomatoes would stay. I feel like I remember a few years ago there was this news story about an 18 wheel that wrecked on an interstate, and all these tomatoes rolled out and just like, were like softballs. You know, none of them were damaged whatsoever because it was these hard green things that just, yes. So that sort of production is absolutely why a tomato that you're normally gonna get in a grocery store doesn't taste like anything. And I mean, it's like with any plant breeding program, you're kind of sacrificing one thing for the other, right? It, until some genius comes along that can figure it out that you can have a flavorful tomato that also will store for a month and a half, you're gonna have flavorless tomatoes. Yeah, it's a shame. Sad but true. Um, which is the big argument some people have with the whole native versus non-native argument, right? Even the cultivars. If you have a echinacea plant that you have bred over and over and over again to have these sunset orange petals instead of the pink petals, you very likely have sacrificed other things, which quite often is the pollen. Right, so even though it's making a flower and it's out there, it doesn't have any pollen on it. So even if an insect comes to it, they don't get a meal while they're there. So balancing that is a big part of why some of the people who are really focused on natives are like, cultivars don't count, right? Um, if you grow your own tomatoes in a greenhouse, you absolutely can grow the varieties that taste good. And then you get a good tomato, but not from a store. Sad but true. Um, I did, I didn't actually work there, but I uh, worked very near and got to go into this greenhouse in Colorado that did tomato production. And they had uh, these hot water tubes that ran through the ground, so it kept the ground warm all winter. And they had the tomatoes on these big trellises that you could, they pulled up on ropes and it went all the way to the roof. And they grew actual flavorful tomatoes. It's the only time I've ever seen tomato production in a greenhouse that was flavorful. But you know, Coloradians, they're super into all that kind of thing. And their veggies and their greenhouses and stuff. Yeah, and there was a second one. Yeah, when you're speaking about value crops, has there been any investigation of 
cannabis production? Of course. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, so hemp is legal in all of the uh, Appalachian states, right? Was it maybe six or seven years ago? All of the states, Kentucky, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, all of them legalized hemp production, right? So you can grow fiber hemp already in our state. Uh, Virginia, I guess last year legalized non-medicinal cannabis production. I think it's supposed to go live in stores maybe next year. Um, North Carolina is one of the last of our sort of southwestern states that is still not making it legal. Um, that being said, there are a couple of greenhouse companies that are growing basil indoors. There is no reason to grow basil indoors <laughs> <laughs> except that you are preparing your materials for when they finally legalize it. <laughs> basil does not bring in enough money to justify all of that infrastructure. So if you ever go across a greenhouse company that is doing something like that, that is what they are doing, is they are waiting patiently for that moment so that they are prepared before other people are, right? They are gonna get their permits first, they've already got their infrastructure in place, and they will be able to jump in right away. Um, I have not been following super closely any of the legislative business in North Carolina because honestly it will happen when it happens in my world. Um, Plant, that you have to use all this technical equipment because it has been grown illegally for so long in grow rooms in a house, right? So you do need lights and water and all of these crazy things to make it grow. As soon as you put it outside, off it goes, right? It is a very hardy plant. You can do whatever it wants. Um, it, one of its only cousins is, is hops. Hops is in the same family. Um, Wicked Weed Brewery is named after, uh, I, I want to say it's one of the King Phillips or something called hops a wicked weed and uh, hops has been just as illegal as marijuana off and on throughout time because we want those peasants to go having too much fun right can we put that hops into beer no 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 beer is a food it's just wheat it's just preserved no no so again it's only a matter of time before that wave shifts throughout time just like it has around any of those other plants uh, but yes they're very closely related uh, both really itchy. If you've ever gotten to touch hops, you can't walk through them. They're very, very itchy on your skin. Um, and cannabis is the same. Super itchy. Why well, they come up uh, in the shape of sleeves or. Uh, yeah, those farmer sleeves. Farmer sleeves. Yeah. Yeah, because if you touch up against it, it, it contact dermatitis almost right away. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very difficult plant to navigate around with bare skin. Uh, hops is another specialty crop that we cover and that the horticultural crops research is working on. So most hop production uh, happens out of the Pacific Northwest, right where they have sort of these longer, somewhat milder summers. We have really hot, humid summers and hops just can't quite enjoy that. They get terrible fungal diseases. So they're doing all sorts of breeding programs there to see if we can figure out how to grow hops here and supply all of these breweries that are around here with hops right from our region as opposed to having to ship it all in from somewhere else. Um, I'm pretty sure the woman who runs the specialty crops is still open to anybody who has like wild hops on your property or if you find it, she tries to get people to bring her wild hops because if they're here and happy and you can cross them, then suddenly you can get a hop that might actually produce in our region because they don't really. They get those fungal diseases then suddenly a frost comes and it, Again, you just don't get enough of a crop to make it valuable. Wow. So, yeah. Is there a question over there? No? Excellent. Y'all have had some great questions. <laughs> um, I don't know what time it is. I'm more, I am obviously a talker, so I will talk just as long as y'all want me to. Um, I can give a two hour lecture with the best of them. Um, but if we're coming close, y'all just let me know. If, if there are additional questions, I wanted to make sure that we all had an opportunity to know where your money goes. Uh, the largest effort uh, that our club has is our production of annuals and perennials uh, on the property that we call the Horticultural Center. And that goes to funding our scholarship which are now exclusively at Blue Ridge uh, because it is the only school that is currently offering a horticultural program. 
And according to Randy, the best one in Western North Carolina. Probably an associate's degree, I think. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think Haywood still has some classes, maybe certificates, right. diplomas, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. right. So can our you, question here is now. Uh, can you tell us how large uh, the greenhouse industry is in Henderson County? How many acres, how much value? Because I know there's some really massive mm -hmm. production systems there. I, I can give you estimates. I don't have those numbers just in my head by any means, um, but I would say several hundred acres under glass at this point between tri Hitchell, Ben Wingerden, Bright Farms, um, oh gosh, and there's another one I just, starts with an S and it's gonna jump up my head because I'm trying to remember it right now, but those are all massive greenhouse companies, right? They have acres and acres under glass. Some um, of them are relatively new, aren't they? Yes, so Bright Farms, again, just came in, and that other one I'm trying to remember, they don't even have their greenhouse built yet. So they're moving into our area and building a really large one. Um, I know that the income they produce is in the millions. And that's, uh, they're now coming in mostly with special vegetables, baby vegetables? I mean. They're all a little different, right? So tri is very specifically vegetables. They do watermelons, tomatoes, and I wanna say maybe one other cucurbit. And then Van Wingerden is entirely ornamentals, right? So they're doing mostly spring, uh, spring bedding plants, and then they do some poinsettias and mums. Uh, Bright Farms is going to be veggies. Uh, I think they do mixed veggies, but again, high value ones. So it's going to be watermelons out of season, um, tomatoes out of season, that kind of thing. Uh, the one with an S that I can't remember. Honestly, I don't know as much about them. I saw a little blurb that I get all sorts of postings uh, from the extension office and. Honestly, I don't remember exactly what they're producing. So it's a little all over the boards, right? But it's a growth industry. Very much so, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you, more and more are coming. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. You're so welcome. Yeah. If someday you have about 15 minutes, I will sit and talk with you about the uh, various starts and misstarts and machinations required to get Rachel here today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's the beginning of the semester, so my schedule is usually very full this time of year. And uh, did we ran into, anyway, we ran into <laughs> several different hiccups, and I wasn't at all sure until about 10 days ago that we're going to be able to do this. So I'm very particularly glad that we were able to do this and have the turnout that we do. As she was talking about the zombies ants a while ago, it reminded me of a, an episode I saw, I think it was from Richard Attenborough, anyway, pointing out that uh, camelboys all share this one trait, whether they're dromedaries or they're Bactrian camels or they're uh, llamas or alpacas, they love to spit on you. Um, and probably the alpaca is the very worst because there are actually documented cases of recently deceased alpacas who are lying there and are upset about having died. <laughs> and if you walk by them, they will still spit on it. <laughs> Which is where that term comes from. Uh, beware the zombie alpacalypse. <laughs> uh, 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 uh,